All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, we're really excited to have everybody join us from all over the all over the planet. I think, um, in terms of where everybody everybody is. I'm Rick Curtis, the director of Outdoor Action. Caroline. Hi, everyone. My name is Caroline Stone. I'm the program coordinator for OA. I use she, her pronouns. And we are really excited to welcome uh, Case and Crane, class of 17, as, uh, as tonight's speaker. So for, for people who did virtual frost trip this year, obviously the Everest climb was a, a big part of virtual frost trip, and some of the frost trip coordinators are here, and so they got to plan all of that. And one of the things that we did as, as part of Everest's activity was trying to think about how we could take um, Everest and, and make it something that was a broader sort of thought process than just the climb itself and just the activity and, and, and the fun. So one of the things that we did was we, we highlighted a TEDx talk that Kaysen did uh, a number of years ago. And, and when that got posted um, out on, on Instagram about Everest, Case and saw it on the university Instagram and then emailed right away and said, Oh, this is so exciting. I'd be happy to come and give a talk if you wanted me to come and talk. And we said, are you kidding? Of course we would love for you to come and talk. So we're super excited to have Case in here. So as I said, Case is class of 17, grew up in Lawrenceville near Princeton. And I actually, knew his his mom was an outdoor action leader she was class of 86 so i knew Kaysen's mom kind of early in my career i think that was like my fifth year as the director of oa so we're really excited i mean the whole crane family are adventurers so Kaysen kind of grew up with adventure kind of as you know i don't know if a is your middle initial Kaysen a for adventure crane but it probably should be because uh, it, it sort of it's runs in the family and Kaysen got bitten early by the mountain bug and made it a, a not only did it become a passion for him but he also made it a cause not just a personal passion of something to do you know for himself but really to think about how he could make climbing and particularly the goal of climbing the seven summits each of the seven tallest mountains in each of the seven continents, how he could do that uh, in a way that would have an impact for others. And so that's kind of all for me to say, because I think Kaysen, Kaysen has his own story um, and he's much more interesting to listen to than I am. So I just want to say from Caroline and I, thanks so much Kaysen for joining us and we'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Rick, and thank you, Caroline. Thanks to the whole OA team and the LGBT Center. I'm, I'm really uh, honored to be here chatting with, with all of you all um, in this crazy, crazy time. I, you know, obviously it, it's almost cliche at this point, but um, I feel very lucky that, uh, that I, I'm having this opportunity to connect with you all. And I hope that we have a really fun and engaging next hour or so. Um, so, I'm just going to start, I, I, some of you may have seen uh, the TEDx talk that uh, was shared as part of the OA program, and maybe some of you didn't. So I'm going to try not to have too much overlap um, and go through uh, in a slightly different format than I have in the past uh, for about 15 minutes, and then, you know, talk about whatever you want to talk about. Questions for those who did do the, uh, the OA uh, Everest uh, program this year. If you have questions about uh, that experience and how it compares to real life, I'm happy to talk about that, uh, though I haven't done the actual simulation itself. So you'll have to tell me more about it. Uh, but I'm really, really excited. And, and I, I hope that this is uh, going to be a fun and, and uh, entertaining and educational uh, hour for everyone. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, so I mentioned before that I'm going to try and do a slightly different, um, you know, because I know some of you may have be more or less familiar with uh, the the story of my seven summons. I thought I'd approach it in a little bit different, uh, in a little bit of a different way, especially because 
Um, I thought, you know, having just graduated from Princeton a couple of years ago, I felt like there were some parallels that could be directly applicable uh, to, to you, especially those of you who, uh, who are freshmen who are starting out, but really at any point in your Princeton career. Um, and so these are the five lessons I want to talk through in these first 15 minutes. And, you know, of course, after that, we can circle back to any of these points or talk about anything else that you like. The first is initiative. And by that, I mean making the most of your privilege, making the most of one's privilege. Uh, the second is risk. And by this, I mean challenging yourself or oneself to try to take things on, to try and pursue challenges that you might fail at. Um, you know, there's a lot of risk means a lot of things, a lot of different people. But for me, it means something that you could actually fail at. Teamwork is the third one. So to me, that means meeting people where they are with love with love, with empathy, even people from different backgrounds get to that. Uh, the fourth is goals. Uh, goals are obviously important, you know, and all of us in this room clearly are at least somewhat goal oriented, but I wanna talk specifically about defining and redefining success um, and, and, and that sort of, that form of, uh, or that aspect of goal setting. And the fifth is hope. Um, you know, for a lot of people right now, this is a very dark time. And so I want to talk a little bit about searching for a silver lining. So I'm going to jump right into the first lesson, um, which is the making, the making the most of your privilege. I was very, very lucky to grow up uh, in a family and uh, with a background that was uh, both very supportive. And, and, and I was also very lucky to be afforded a lot of opportunities growing up. I had the opportunity to go to school. I had the opportunity to do sports. Um, and I ultimately went away to boarding school. Um, and so I just want to preface this by saying that, you know, we, all of us in this room have uh, a wide range of uh, privilege and privileges that we grew up with or not. Um, and I just want to be upfront that I fully recognize that I had a lot of opportunities that are not available to most people. Um, so, you know, what I want to specifically talk about, though, is making the most of whatever opportunities are available to you. And the common thread for all of us in this Zoom room right now is Princeton. And so putting aside, uh, you know, one specific background, I think that there are uh, just in the nature of uh, being at Princeton, being a part of the Princeton community, that opens up worlds for you or can open up worlds for you, uh, whether it's thesis funding or, um, you know, getting connected to an, uh, an IIP program for the summer or just the people in this community, the professors, your classmates. I, I think that, you know, the first lesson, the one that's really important is just, you know, make the most of all those resources and try and be as creative as possible uh, at doing that. And the connection to my personal story goes back to the very beginning. When I, was, when I was in high school, I unfortunately lost a dear friend, uh, as you see on the right, um, my dear friend Charlotte, to suicide. Um, and as a young, as you can see on the left, that's me actually in middle school, I was a young and relatively, uh, well, I guess flamboyant, for lack of a better word, um, energetic personality. Um, and... I was really devastated by this loss. Um, it was almost incomprehensible to me that someone, one of my peers, one of my friends, um, someone with a lot of privilege herself, that she could be struggling in such a way that it would result in her death. Um, and what I felt was a very preventable death. And so I decided that, you know, I would try and make the most of the privilege that I had and do what I could to try and address that issue of youth suicide, specifically in the LGBTQ community. And so I got connected with the Trevor Project and I was 17 at the time. And I went to them and I said, I want to do whatever I can to help you guys. What can I do? Like put me on the phone lines, you know, it, you know, it put me on the Trevor Project runs the nation's only 24 seven free and confidential suicide lifeline for the LGBTQ youth. And I was like, I want to be one of those people making sure that nobody else makes the same tragic decision that Charlotte did. And they said, case, and we love your enthusiasm, but you're under 18. We actually, like you, you cannot answer the phones for us. We're so sorry. Um, and so 
I was, I, I, it forced me to get more creative about making the most of the resources I had available. And so what I ultimately decided to do was raise money for the Trevor Project and raise awareness for the Trevor Project services through climbing the highest mountain on each continent, climbing the seven summits, uh, as Rick mentioned. And, you know, to me, this was kind of similar to how people run a marathon for, uh, you know, for cancer research, uh, but, you know, on a slightly, slightly bigger scale than that. Um, and so they said, okay to that. And, uh, and so I set out to climb the seven summits uh, on a gap year in between high school and college. Um, and so this graphic, I like this graphic, I'm borrowing it from the uh, like Irish climbing organization. But what I like about it a lot is you can actually see at the different altitudes, uh, you know, where, for example, uh, a, a typical, um, jetliner will fly you know at approximately the altitude of the summit of everest um so it's 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 a it's a cool infographic and it shows you as well the scale of all seven of these peaks so um so i set out on this journey um and so one of the the mountains i think it was the uh, it was the third mountain i climbed on this journey was a mountain called karsten's pyramid and i mentioned that because it directly ties to the second lesson that i want to talk about which is challenging yourself to try things you might fail at. Now you might think, well, aren't all of these seven mountains, uh, you know, mountains that you might fail at, isn't all of it a, a bit of a challenge and, and, and a risk? Uh, and the answer is yes, to some degree, but Karsten's pyramid presented a particular challenge for me. And that was because I am afraid of heights. Now that sounds ludicrous because, you know, we're talking about some of the highest mountains in the world, but Believe it or not, on most big mountains, you're not usually like looking off of a cliff, if that makes sense. In fact, you're usually looking straight in front of you at the ground, and it doesn't actually feel that steep a lot of the time. Karsten's Pyramid is the exception. As you can see in this image, it is almost a sheer rock face. Not to mention, uh, it requires uh, a significant technical capability and skill, which I was learning, but did not feel, uh, you know, like I had mastered at that point. But I decided that I would take this on anyway, um, because to me, you know, learning these new skills and pushing myself out of my comfort zone was a critical part of the journey. Um, and in fact, uh, I want to give some credit where credit is due. I actually did this peak with my mother who is also afraid of heights. Um, and this is a little taste of what we had to uh, endure um, despite our shared fear. Um, and this is, by the way, this video, I took it on a GoPro. So it's actually got a fisheye lens. Um, so that really is a sheer drop uh, about 2000 feet down. I'm going very slowly. Um, and the rope itself, you see, I am tied into that rope but it was fraying in places, which did not make me feel any better. Um, and so in terms of how this video, I guess I'll just let this play in the background, but I thought this was also a really important lesson to share uh, for, those, uh, for, you know, for those of you, for those of us starting at Princeton, because you know, everyone who goes to Princeton has worked very, very hard to get there. But I think a lot of the time people uh, aiming to be supportive uh, will almost encourage new students uh, to not take risks when they first get to Princeton. And I think that there is some merit to that advice. But if there's one person in your life who is who you know has a different message, let it be me, which is, you know what, like if you want to take that fifth class or sixth class, even though your advisor you know says that, that would be crazy freshman fall to take anything more than four, take it, sign up for the class. You don't actually need your advisor's actual signature. You can just do it. Um, and I say that because, uh, you know, there without, you know, there's the, the famous expression without great risk, there's no, you know, no great rewards. Um, and so don't limit yourself. That does not mean that every risk you take will be a raging success, but, you never will have that success unless you try to push yourself out of your comfort zone uh, occasionally. Um, so 
that's, and, and by the way, that lesson is applicable, you know, not just for freshmen. I mean, it, it can be applicable in a lot of, a lot of different cases as well, whether it's trying a new extracurricular um, or even just branching out and, and taking that brave step of making some new friends who you think might broaden your perspective, which leads me to my third lesson, which is try to meet people where they are with love. And so this lesson, um, I want to talk about three specific dimensions. The first is my direct climbing experience. Um, so briefly, uh, there was a moment on one of my climbs when I, uh, I interacted with another group of climbers uh, who were extremely homophobic and said some very, very negative and homophobic things about me um, to people in our camp and on the mountain. And that was extremely hurtful for me. Um, and, you know, so also I had a, a pride flag that I climbed with and had on my tent. So it was very visible and obvious. And to me, that was a positive thing to them. Not so much. You can imagine probably the sort of language they used. And what made matters worse was this was a group of, of veterans and wounded warriors whom I respected uh, and still respect tremendously. I mean, they were attempting one of the hardest peaks in the world and one of the most, this was actually on Denali in Alaska, one of the most physical mountains in the world, uh, in many cases with only one, uh, one leg or, I mean, I think, I think there was actually a double uh, leg amputee in their expedition. It, it was a really inspiring group. And this, it was, was very hard for me to deal with. Um, and I, I, in that moment, I mean, I, I was just shocked. I didn't even know how to respond. And then uh, a couple months later, I was on Everest and there was another group of veterans climbing. And I briefly had this thought of, oh my gosh, am I going to, you know, I, it, I had two thoughts. First was, am I going to be kind of harassed by these people like the other veterans did? And the second was, you know, screw those other veterans. You know, if, if this is a culture thing, then, you know, these people are probably the same and I don't want to interact with them anyway. And despite that, I was able to put those thoughts aside and I introduced myself to this group of, it was actually, it was all men. Uh, so this group of, of Air Force veterans specifically. And I'm so glad that I did because those six guys ended up being some of the bravest, kindest, and most supportive people I met in my entire Everest expedition. And they were so different from the folks that I had had an unfortunate experience with on Denali. But the lesson I learned from this was not that, you know, there's a few bad apples from every, uh, you know, in every orchard. It was actually that people come from a very wide range of backgrounds and experiences. And some of those might be antithetical to my own views, my values, my philosophy on life. But I should all, we should all always strive to be open-minded, even with those same people, because people can also change. And in my conversations, getting to know these Air Force veterans, not some of them had grown up in more uh, you know, in more liberal parts, but some had grown up in very homophobic communities themselves and had evolved over time. And uh, that was really, really impactful to me. Um, and so as you enter in Princeton or pursue your career at Princeton, you know, try to branch out. And if there are people, they might believe things politically or otherwise in today's polarized world, there's so much negativity, but we don't have to hate people with different backgrounds. Um, and instead, the more we can try to approach them with love, the better, the, the higher the likelihood that eventually our personal evolutions, uh, our personal evolutions as people will get us to a place where we actually find common ground. Um, so I shared a couple additional photos here because you know one of the ways this directly manifests in climbing is teamwork. Um, so you have to do that with the people. You don't always get a choice in who's on your team. You don't always get to decide whether, you know, it's a team of people who necessarily share all your backgrounds or views. But as you can see in this photo, sometimes you're crawling on, on tiny ladders across massive crevasses um, or, you know, climbing up through the Kumba Icefall. This is the Kumba Icefall, uh, which is incredibly dangerous and your lives are in each other's hands. So 
like that helped me reach this perspective um, that, you know, we're all, we should always be as open-minded as possible uh, on people's personal ability to evolve and change. Um, and the, the, so the fourth lesson, and I'll try and go a little quicker here because I really want to, um, to have as much time as possible for conversation and questions. Uh, but this one is really, really important and it's about success and, and goals. Um, as I said, we're all probably very goal oriented folks. Um, but I think the specific angle that I want to emphasize here is the importance of defining success for ourselves and also being comfortable redefining it. So this photo of me is on Denali, the highest mountain in North America. I've already mentioned it. And I mentioned it in part because I actually ended up climbing it twice. The first time I climbed it, I didn't get to the summit. This is not a photo of the summit. This is a photo at, at 14,000 feet. Uh, and that was incredibly challenging for me. I mean, I, I had worked so hard for a month and then ultimately a month of climbing got me stuck in this blizzard. This is a photo, I mean a video. That video, that wind, we endured that at 17,000 feet for six and a half days. And it was so frustrating to feel so good, to feel so motivated and energized, have a great team and to be stuck in this blizzard. Um, knowing that that, that bear, that the, the, the success, the definition of success I had set was getting to the summit. And after being stuck in the blizzard for a week, that was no longer an option. And so I wish I could tell you that in that moment, I immediately got comfortable with redefining success to just getting off the mountain, but that was not the case. It took something a lot scarier. Uh, when we finally got a, a break in the weather to start climbing down from high camp on Denali to the second highest camp, we were traversing a, what's called a knife edge ridge. It's a very, very, it's a, it's a steep ridge with a sheer drop on either side. And uh, as on many glaciated peaks or all glaciated peaks, you're, you're roped up to your teammates in case someone falls into a crevasse or falls off the ridge. That way you have a chance to self arrest using an ice axe. So basically slamming your ice axe into the ice to stop that fall um, because people do make mistakes. And sure enough, I was the second person on my rope team and Greg, my teammate, all of a sudden with no warning, slipped off the side of the ridge. And immediately it was, it was like out of this, out of a dream within a millisecond, I would, if, or what it felt like a millisecond, I was on the ground starting to, you know, be dragged off the ridge myself. Luckily I was able to self arrest and stop our rope team from falling. I mean, truly, you know, potentially thousands of feet down. Um, and that was the moment when I realized that it was critical that, well, first of all, that getting off the mountain in one piece safely is always the top priority. But second of all, that, uh, you know, there are more important things and that redefining success does not mean failure. It means that you're giving yourself the opportunity to take another stab at something at another point. There are very, very, very few moments in life, I realize that, especially in the outdoors, um, that are truly one-off uh, one experiences. Um, and so sure enough, I was able to return to Denali the following summer. I spent another month on the mountain, but I did eventually uh, achieve that initial goal. Uh, but by the time I got to the summit, I was actually comfortable not summiting because of that experience on the knife edge ridge, it helped me realize the importance of being flexible about one's goals and realizing that what seems like the end uh, or what seems like failure is not actually ultimately failure. And so this is actually a photo on the summit of Everest. Um, and I just wanna conclude with the final, uh, the final lesson quickly, which is trying to search for a silver lining. This one is more, kind of broadly applicable to the times we're living in now. Um, these are photos of me, not from any mountains. On the left, this is from a 24 hour Tough Mudder I did with my sister and my boyfriend. And on the right is a photo of me and my mom in the purple swim cap right in front of me uh, in Ironman, Wisconsin last year. Um, and so the lesson I want to share here, I mean, it's, I think we all kind of get where this is going. Like we're in these crazy times, people, this is very hard for many people. And, and I have to say, again, to be honest, like 
this has been much, much harder for many, many other people than I. I've been very lucky to not have, you know, any immediate family or friends get sick or, or die because of COVID or, or lose their jobs. And so I am so, so lucky. But on, you know, in, in a different context, you know, two years ago, my mother was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and given three months to live. And luckily, she's still very much alive to this day, just over two years later. But that moment, again, it's not a climbing story, but I do think it's important to share because that was an incredibly difficult and um, painful uh, and scary uh, moment in my life. But what was so inspiring was how instead of having, instead of taking that news badly and, and freaking out, it only motivated my mother to be more energized about living her life to the fullest and pursuing her passions. In that case, it's doing Ironman triathlons and running her, her art gallery in Philadelphia. Um, and that helps me to realize that, you know, whenever you're faced with what seems like uh, a truly terrible situation, instead of uh, trying to change something that really unfortunately can't be changed, just try and think about how to make the most of it. How does this change your perspective and open up new doors that would not have otherwise been available? And so for, you know, the Princeton, for, for people starting at Princeton now, it might mean, you know what, starting, starting college remote might mean that it's an opportunity to meet people or actually become friends with people that if you were on campus, honestly, maybe it would have been too clicky to become friends with those people. Or maybe it means taking on a new hobby that you never thought you'd have the time uh, to try. Um, so whatever it is, always try and search for the silver lining. For me, that is starting a cold brew coffee business called Explore Cold Brew. Um, check us out. Uh, we're launching in a couple weeks. Um, and with that, I will switch over to Q&A um, uh, and uh, talk about whatever you all want to discuss. Kason, thank you. So, um, Caroline, how do we, do we want people to uh, raise hands or how would you, how would you like to? I think, I think our group's a manageable enough size that we can do Q&A. Well, let's try Q&A live uh, with yeah. folks just unmuting yourself if you have a question. And if that is unmanageable, then we'll, we'll try a different strategy. Can I ask can how I many of you all did the uh, OA did OA um, this fall versus um, not? Like, did the Everest OA component? Cool. Just curious. Yeah. And there are a bunch of folks here who they're both leaders and participants, and there's a variety of people who are on this. Awesome. Mary, sorry, I think I cut you off. You said you had a question? Yeah, no, 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 that's okay. Um, so I'm wondering just in terms of like, obviously these are absolutely sort of incredible feats and it was just so interesting to hear about your experience with that. And I'm wondering sort of what the financial side of that is. And I hope that's not too much of a personal question, but I know like definitely something that I was struggling with when we were doing the Everest simulation is it's sort of like, I mean, this is an enormous, enormous privilege to even, you know, spend a month on a mountain when a lot of people have the reality of having to have a summer job. And I wonder how, like, sort of that worked for you and also how you talk about that and can empower others to be outside, because that's something we at OA have been thinking a lot about, how, how to situate privilege and also encourage others to still um, pursue outdoor adventure and activity. I think that's a it's a great question, Mary, and I'm I'm glad you asked it. I mean, because you're right, Everest especially is extremely resource intensive. Not just the financial commitment of getting there, but also you know being able to take two months at least uh, just for the climb. I mean, let alone getting halfway around the world and all the other associated costs. It's it's incredibly re incredibly resource intensive expedition. Um, and, you know, climbing in general is very resource intensive. Um, personally, I was very, very fortunate to be in a position where my family financially supported the climbs, which they agreed to do. And I would only have, I would have only been comfortable doing so uh, 
they they would have they were only comfortable doing that and i was only comfortable with them doing that um because i was raising money for the trevor project if that makes sense it it didn't i could not um to me it felt too selfish to be taking such a uh take on taking on such a resource intensive uh endeavor without giving back and so you know that said like i i have had so many you know, a privilege as a white male, privilege coming from an affluent background. Like I, I've been privileged, have been, had an incredible access to education my whole life. I've had privilege in many forms to the max and I'm so lucky. And to be honest, Mary, I got actually criticized uh, by some people when I was climbing on those grounds. And to me, I never fully understood that because I was trying to make the most of the privileges I had, which were very... I mean, luckily we're extensive. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I think I'll just tie this back to the first lesson, which is that we all to some degree, especially people like in this room specifically with just through our affiliation with Princeton have privilege. Even if outside of Princeton, I, you know, there's obviously a wide range uh, of backgrounds of, of situations, and what I would say is that Princeton affords us kind of a unifying um, opportunity, you know, even if it's just being involved in OA is a great, you know, it's a great way to be involved in the outdoors through Princeton. Um, and so I don't have a perfect answer, but I do think that it's amazing to see a lot of organizations starting to, uh, in the last few years, starting to reach out to more disadvantaged communities to get them more involved in the outdoors, in exercise programs that allow them to um, hopefully get some of that magical experience, even if they don't have, if, even if they're from a more disadvantaged, disadvantaged background. So um, does that answer, oh, there's one other thing actually I wanna add to that because I don't know if I explicitly mentioned it, but I just want to, cause it's really very important. Um, I think to me, it, it goes without saying, which is why, I mean, I've mentioned it explicitly, but I, I, you know, I could not have gotten to the top of any of these mountains without my team members, which includes, especially in Everest, an incredible team of Sherpa climbing, uh, cl climbing Sherpas um, and support Sherpas in all forms. And I just want to say, because I, I don't think I touched on that before, but the Sherpa people and the, Sher the climbing Sherpas are true heroes. And, you know, there have been, uh, it does, you know, climbing both brings risk and tragedy, and it also does bring uh, some economic, um, some uh, kind of additional economic income to what is otherwise a, a disadvantaged part of the world. Um, and so I was very lucky to have two amazing climbing Sherpa um, that uh, I have tremendous respect for. So I just wanted to mention that as well, because it is really, really important. I have a question. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk more about the um, fundraising aspect of um, your endeavor. Like, I feel like, at least for me, um, maybe others have this question, but I, I think it's really cool how um, people go and take on projects like these. But I feel like um, there's a lot of like gray area about how one actually gets people to donate or raise money for these um, projects are interesting. And I was wondering if you could touch on that. Yeah, that's, that's a, a great question, Felicity. Um, so, I mean, the climbing was the easy part. <laughs> Fundraising was the real challenge. Um, you know, it, it's, I, I wish I had like a, a silver bullet to be like, this is the way to do it. Uh, but I don't. I think that, I mean, the, the most important thing is identifying a cause or a set of causes that you are passionate about because people recognize passion. And the more passionate you are, the more knowledgeable you are about an issue or a cause, um, that it, that really resonates with people, at least. And that was my experience. You know, I, Whenever I met someone, whether it was the person I was sitting next to on an airplane or someone, you know, a friend of a friend or whatever it is, I was always talking about the Trevor Project, about the issue of suicide in the LGBTQ community, the, especially in the trans community. I mean, luckily now, seven years later, 
I feel like there's greater visibility of issues in the trans community, but then, you know, it did not get the same level of uh, attention that it, it does now. And even still, there's more to be done. So um, personal passion goes a long way, but then also tactically, I feel like there's some, you know, if I can give some advice, I think it's like, don't be afraid, you know, you don't, it's nothing has, not everything has to be on a massive scale. Um, you know, I was in, I personally was very inspired, uh, because a couple weeks ago, my, my brother, one of my younger brothers, uh, who is a rising junior or he, sorry, he's a junior now at Princeton. Uh, he was incredibly dismayed by the, uh, uh, the treatment of the, uh, I think it's we Uyghur minority in, in China. Um, and so he decided that he was going to get a bunch of, he, he, recruited three of his friends, convinced them that it was truly like a, a massive tragedy and uh, desperately in need of greater attention, recognition and uh, intervention. And together, the, the four of them just ran for 24, 24 hours um, to raise money and awareness for this cause. And when people do crazy things like run for 24 hours straight, um, it tends to get people more aware of a certain issue um, and, and also, I guess, more, they're more willing to, to give. That said, you know, you don't have to run 24 hours. That's not the only way to do it. But if you can find a way to bridge something that you're kind of uniquely interested in with that cause, you know, if you're an artist, maybe it's, you know, coming up with, or, you know, say you're a, a painter, maybe it's painting a couple, a series of paintings that you auction off for sale for a cause. Or maybe if you're, um, you know, if you're a yoga instructor, you know, like my friend, my sister's friend, Lucy Herring is a, uh, like a hit class instructor, kind of just an, an amateur hit class instructor. She's good though, by the way, if you ever see Lucy Herring take a class. Um, and so she did a couple uh, fundraisers for lung cancer uh, in support of uh, the lung cancer foundation that my mom is connected with. Um, and, you know, it, it, she's not some celebrity trainer or anything, but people, that it, it really resonates when there's a, a personal passion both for the kind of for the fundraiser activity and also for the cause so does that does that answer your question that was really helpful thank you case and i'm curious how your expedition team changed amongst the seven summits um, were there some people or guides um who were consistent amongst the different expeditions or was there a lot of variability? And, and, and if so, how did you go about building a new team on each new expedition? That's a yeah, great question, Caroline. So there was a fair amount of variability um, across different teams because I was, I was doing it on a more rapid timeline than most people do. So there wasn't, uh, you know, I, I did all seven summits in a year and a half. Um, and so most people are not, doing the seven mountains in that that's pretty much as quick as you can do it because of the seasons uh and the climbing seasons um so <laughs> i didn't get into the details of this in i think it was lesson number three or four might be four which is me like meeting people where they are with love but having you know seven different teams in such a short time period and being thrust into these incredibly stressful at times like life or death moments uh, is very, very hard. And, and there were times, okay, luckily, <laughs> I was not usually the cause of the drama, but there was occasionally some major drama. Um, I had a climbing partner, or tent mate, whom I will not name, but she's a, she's a strong climber with some, uh, she has a unique personality. Um, and uh, she really, really, really didn't get along with one of our other four uh, teammates. And it was, it was a very scary moment. I mean, they at one point almost came to blows. Um, this is, again, on Denali. I feel like Denali is like just a recipe for drama. They should start filming like reality TV shows on, on Denali, like in these little camps. Um, and, and we almost all went down because of it. Because, you know, if you're not able to put differences aside and work together as a team, it is not safe for you to be on the mountain. 
And in this specific case, there was a very, very, very serious disagreement. And to this day, I don't have an opinion. Like it, it, it was, it's a very personal and very, it was a very, very strongly felt disagreement between these two uh, for quite personal reasons. And thankfully, through strong intervention by our exhibition leader, uh, I mean, honestly, like inspirational leadership, she was able to broker a kind of um, detente, like some, like a, 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 a truce between these two teammates of mine that allowed us to continue safely. Um, but yeah, so jumping from team to team is, is definitely always stressful. Um, in terms of you asked specifically about like common threads, my climbing coach was also my exhibition leader on Everest. And she is one of my heroes. Her name is Lydia Brady. She was actually the first woman to summit Everest without any supplemental oxygen uh, back in 1988. And she had an incredibly inspiring story um, that I think hopefully this group appreciates. When she did that climb in uh, maybe it was 88 or 89, uh, the men, it's, it was and still is largely a male dominated, straight male dominated environment. Uh, they didn't believe she'd done it actually. They, like for years, her summit was not considered valid. Uh, like it was not, it, people didn't believe um, she had actually made it to the top without oxygen. They thought it was not humanly possible. Well, to be fair, they hadn't thought it was humanly possible for anyone, like anyone male or female up until a couple of years prior to that. But then they definitely didn't think it was possible for a woman to do it, uh, which is obviously incredibly sexist and wrong. Um, and so she, uh, look her up, Lydia Brady. She's an incredibly cool, friendly, loving, strong, badass climber and woman. And I'm so lucky to have had her both as my coach and also my, uh, my Everest expedition leader. I guess I had a question sort of like climbing the summits is obviously not any small deal. How do you continue with life after doing something so grand so early? Oh, um, thank you, uh, Wilbur. That's a, um, it's a, it's an interesting question. Uh, the, all of the seven summits were very meaningful and impactful to me. Um, and especially Everest. I, I mean, I, from a, you know, we all have like childhood dreams and I, I think, I've talked about privilege a couple times. I think for me, um, I realized then, and I still obviously still appreciate now, but I realized in that moment from the get-go how lucky I was to even get that opportunity, um, to even come close to getting that opportunity, to even just get a chance to attempt it. It, it, it felt so, I just, I, I, it, it felt surreal the whole time. And when I ultimately got to the summit, I, I mean, I spent 45 minutes on the summit and I think I was crying for half an hour of that. Um, it was such an emotionally um, powerful moment for me to have realized a childhood dream, less so because of my own talent or skills or anything, but just because the stars aligned that, you know, I was just lucky enough to get that opportunity. And um, so that, it, it never felt like, I had achieved, like this sounds silly, but it didn't really feel like I had achieved this great thing. It was more just, I was so lucky to get this opportunity to get this. So it didn't really feel like I had to like go back to normal, if that makes sense. Like it wasn't like I feel, it didn't feel like I had peaked because it didn't as much feel like a personal achievement as it did a, like just a realization of a childhood dream. Um, and and then I, I started at Princeton a couple months later and that became my next Everest. You know, it became my next, I just wanted to enjoy it as much as possible and make the most of it. And, and I definitely feel like I did. I mean, I loved Princeton. Um, and I, I don't know, I didn't even really, I guess in the freshman fall, I talked about it a couple times because people asked me to, and I'm always, always happy to talk about it, but it wasn't something that I usually proactively brought up when I was at Princeton because um, I was focused on, on making the most of the next opportunities. I mean, I, I just constantly was looking ahead at what could be done next. And, you know, 
I can't reiterate enough, especially now a couple years after graduating, like Princeton sets, uh, you know, better than I think any other place in the world, it sets everyone who goes there up to do so many different things in so many different ways, whether that's, you know, my friend Claire Gallagher, who ended up becoming a professional trail runner uh, and a super, super badass record breaking one at that. Um, I, was she an OA leader? I, she yeah, wasn't I think, an OA leader, no. uh, but she was my class in uh, EB with me. So I knew Claire. Okay. Well, she's just an incredibly, you know, everything from that to, you know, my roommate who is in Y Combinator now working on his startup. Like it, it's just, it's such an incredible community of people, community of teachers and advisors. Um, and so it just, I, I got focused on, on making the most of that. I think follow up on that point then. Um, I think like as a senior, you're, you're surrounded a lot of, by people who are sort of on the opposite ends of the spectrum. So you have the people who are just like really passionate about something and they're ready to go for it. And then on the other side, there is a large portion of the population that sort of looks back on their four years at Princeton and they're kind of jaded. And they say like, I know these people and like now everything that was once, like I'm like friends with Olympians, my next door neighbor is like the daughter of like some president and everything just seems so normal. So there's nothing that's like, I guess, exciting anymore. I guess from your perspective as a someone who has done something that would be considered like of that magnitude and B from your perspective as a Princetonian who has gone through the four years of that experience, how do you navigate the sort of itch to become quote unquote jaded? Hmm. I, I mean, so Wilbur, am I, well, I, I guess, let me say one thing and then maybe it's not addressing the point you're, you're talking about, but I, and maybe this helps clarify what I was saying before, but to me, climbing Everest, while I'm very proud of doing it, and as I said, feel so lucky to do so, I believed and still believe that I will achieve greater things in my life. And that that experience that I had, and I was so lucky to have, uh, was very powerful for me, but does, does not, and, and, and does not, that does not define the kind of, um, the vision I have for my future and what I want to achieve, you know, whether that's having an even greater impact on issues I care about, which, you know, include suicide prevention, but also now a lot of other issues that I got exposed to at Princeton through working with PD Green and, and other, uh, things. So whether it's that or in the corporate field, you know, I'm working on a startup, my startup coffee company right now. I want this to be the next Starbucks, you know, like I, I think it, it, there's a, an element that's like, there's a personal vision for uh, like, I, I guess people have different visions or ambitions for what they want to achieve in their life. And I would say that I would hope that what one has achieved going into Princeton is not the peak of their, their life's, uh, the, you know, that, that's not the peak of their life's ambition, that, that actually they will have many more uh, achievements or successes or just personal, like moments of personal uh, achievement um, in the future. And, and the only other thing I would just quickly add to that is that, you know, that makes it sound like everyone has to, you know, do X, Y, or Z. But I, I think when I, when I said like personal achievement, that can be just, you know, what it, maybe if you're... It just it, it's just what's personally impactful to you, you know what whether depending on what field you're in or what you want to do with your life, um, that can mean a lot of different things. Uh, but does that address your point a little bit better at all? Um, I think yes. You, yeah, you uh, can say no. I, I mean, <laughs> it's not. It it hit on some of the points. It's not. I don't think the question is really like. I don't know. I, I, th I think like one really interesting thing is sort of like looking back on like your path through Princeton, there are very different expectations that you come in with um, regardless of whether or not you have goals of like yeah. what you want to accomplish. Like for people whose goal was to get into Princeton, that's amazing. For people who have goals past Princeton, that's also amazing. I think it's just that, um, there is some sort of notion of by the time you graduate, you sort of get hit in the face with 
a dose of reality, I guess, right? Of like some people yeah. sort of feel that being able to navigate like the the real world, quote unquote, outside of the orange bubble requires some sense of practicality that I think often leads people less onto the side of practicality, but more on the side of jadedness, where they do things um, like you might be familiar with the term like selling out. <laughs> Um, yeah, but yeah. like you know, people go to like tech and consulting and banking because I sold out. It's yeah, it's money, and like you, like the reality is at the end of the day, like you need money. Um, yeah, so I guess yeah. like as I guess from someone who who seems like pretty convicted about um, looking past like the practicality of things and like really thinking about things that you value, how do you navigate that internal conversation between balancing? like the practicality of the world versus like, here are the dreams and visions that I have. Yeah. So that, okay. That is a, yeah, maybe I just misunderstood the, I mean, I think that's a, it's such a great question. Um, and so, I mean, number one, I, I feel like I sold out in some ways from a certain perspective in that, you know, I went to Bain and, and was a consultant for three years. Um, after graduating. And I think I don't regret that. I certainly was, um, you know, skill building, but I think the advice I would give having done that is to really be a lot more, um, reflective and critical, like just thoughtful about the choice, um, before making the choice to sell out or, you know, without any judgment, obviously, I mean, I did it myself. Right. Um, because, I think that what the, the people talk a lot about the recruiting and the finance, big tech consulting coming in and recruiting. I think the biggest downside to them coming in is that they successfully convince so many people that they need that skill building in order to do whatever they want next. And you mentioned kind of practicality and how Princeton, you know, you, you get jaded as you approach the end because it's you're in this orange bubble and then all of a sudden you're confronted with these realities of real life and maybe even feeling forced to sell out. And you know what, if at the end of the day, you have to go work at one of these companies to develop the first couple of years to, to make a salary and develop uh, some skills in the first couple of years, it's not the end of the world. And you can do a lot of things using that as a springboard. But if that's not something that you feel like you need to do. If you have, if you feel like you have a little bit more of a safety net and you're, and you know, you might be, and you're tempted to go into one of those uh, areas, be, be thoughtful about it. I think like people don't often, like people don't tell you enough, you know, to take a risk. And of course, like, again, not everyone has a, a, enough of a safety net to do that. But to be honest, like, I think I am just, I would be just as you know, well-equipped starting my current business three years ago before going to Bain as I am now. Like, it, again, I don't regret it, but other than providing me with like a, fine, a little bit, you know, of a financial safety net of my own, um, you know, independent of my, my parent, like, you know, I, I'm trying to be independent, right? And so other than providing me with a little bit of independent, financial independence, um, I, I would say, yeah, people don't push you to take on different things or to go into different industries enough, I think. I, I mean, to, to look at different options. Um, so I, I would say there's, and sorry, I, I'm kind of, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit, but there's one other thing I really want to add, which is, you know, when I was in my senior spring, I felt super jaded. Um, I felt like I hadn't actually made the as deep friendships with my friends as I thought I had. I felt disillusioned and frustrated about going to work at Bain, feeling like it wasn't, it was almost like a letdown, you know, after, as you said, you know, you're in this orange bubble with like the possibilities are endless, they're limitless. And then it's like, okay, I'm going to work at Bain with like a hundred other kids from like 10 different schools. And like, you know what, this is so demotivating. Um, so if that is similar to what I think the feeling you might be alluding to, you're certainly not alone. Like I felt that way. And I think having three years of additional perspective gave me more hope that that feeling while rooted in real, you know, real feeling 
it's not permanent. You know, even if you end up selling out for necessary reasons or unnecessary reasons, that doesn't define the rest of your life. And, um, and, you know, it might even set you up better to then do whatever you want to do three years later. So, you know, and then on the friendships piece, I think, you know, you just have to look again for the silver lining. Like, I think I realized that I had this like group of, you know, 15, 16 best friends, but honestly, like I really only knew like four of them deeply, which was like a really, really scary realization. But then the silver lining for that is that I just doubled down on those friendships and, and I'm still very, very close friends with those people today. Um, and I maintain other friendships, but like, you know, as you don't, you don't have the, the bandwidth to maintain 16 really, really deep relationships anyway for, and for most people. So, okay. I will pause there. Is that more in line with what you were asking? I'm going to go with yes, mostly because I want other people to ask questions. Okay. Well, Wilbur, <laughs> just shoot me a, like, shoot me an email or, or whatever. And I'm always, I'm happy to chat one-on-one -on -one as well, if that would be helpful. Sure. Yeah, I appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Yeah, and, and, and Kason, and maybe you and, and get you to react to this, you know, um, as, as one of the older people on this call, um, you know, I, one of the things that, that, um, that, I would just sort of bring to the equation is one of the words that we use a lot in OA is intentionality. And I think that, um, you know, the seven summits is really, you know, a, a, a real expression of intentionality behind a particular thing. And so to you, Wilbur, you know, I think you can bring intentionality to all sorts of different things in life. And, you know, um, again, I'm at a different phase in, in my life than, than most of you all, but, you know, so again, you know, thinking about not just work and career, what I'm going to do next, but, you know, um, when you have kids, suddenly your intentionality becomes, you know, revolves around, you know, building a family and things like that. So there are many things in life that you can be intentional about. And so, um, it's not like, okay, oh my gosh, Princeton's done. There's no more intentional chances anymore. You know, there are, there are, you have a whole life in front of you where you'll get to make those choices. So I don't know, Casey, how, how you would respond to that. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And the, I mean, just the only brief addition I would say to complement that is I, I have some friends, a number of friends who sometimes feel stuck on a certain path. And they feel because they made this choice and that choice, now they're kind of stuck in this path and they can't get off of that path. And I think that is a totally false notion. I, that's, I, I just think that's a completely and totally false notion. Is it scary to, you know, jump to a, a slightly different path? Absolutely. Is there a chance that you could fail? Yeah. But if that is the uh, kind of the path that you feel more passionate or motivated to take, or you feel like that you will be personally happier going in a different direction, then you should do it. At whatever point, after graduation, one year later, three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years later, I mean, yeah. I have another quick question if no one else has any questions, but I just was curious about um, your uh, business right now and like, I don't know if you could talk more about that. I don't know, it kind of just piqued my interest. Um, but if anyone else has any questions first, um, feel free to ask them. Well, I'm so, yeah, well, you know, I mean, yeah, I, uh, it's called Explore Cold Brew. Uh, and yeah, I, I was at Bain for three years and I, I was, I, maybe this is speaking to Wilbur's point, maybe not, but I was incredibly disillusioned. I was like, this is, you know, they, in like limitless, you, um, <laughs> you, you, you know, that's the concept where it's like, or the movie that's based on this concept is like, you're only ever using 20% of your brain's full potential. I felt like I was using like 2%. <laughs> I was like, this cannot be like, I'm an incredibly energetic, passionate person. And this is not in line with those values or that experience. Um, and so when COVID hit, um, I was actually on a, uh, like a leave of absence working at a nonprofit, which is kind of a standard. You, you spend six months, uh, most people spend six months 
after three years at Bain and, and do something at a different company or at a nonprofit. So I was in a nonprofit that I was really passionate about. And unfortunately it shut down. And, you know, I, I literally, I, you know, that, that, that fifth lesson about finding the silver lining, I was like, okay, well, this is not good. Um, I'm really upset about this, but like, how can I make the most of this? And I thought, well, you know what? I've always kind of itched to try something entrepreneurial, um, start my own business. And so I thought, you know what, let's do this. I love coffee. I, I've been very frustrated that cold brew coffee, most coffee is like one size fits all when it comes to caffeine. And I was like, there's so many different ways that you can kind of customize your experience when it comes to drinking coffee. Why is caffeine not one of them? So uh, I, I developed Explore Cold Brew, which is the world's first uh, cold brew with customizable primary uh, caffeine levels. Um, and we have our beta launch in two weeks. Um, so check us out, explorecoldbrew.com, Explore Cold Brew on Instagram. Um, if you're looking for uh, an unpaid internship, which I know sucks, I'm so sorry. Mm-hmm. I have, there's a posting, uh, you know, it sounds like, Um, some of you may have seen, uh, Natalie, I think you saw it. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, I can use all the help I can get. It's a, it's a scrappy team of, uh, basically just me. (laughs) Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, and I think my boyfriend would love to have somebody else for me to talk to about the business because, um, I talk his ear off about it at all hours and he provides great advice, but he also has his own job. Um, no, so it's, it's been an incredibly rewarding, challenging, fun, uh, risky, but, but really awesome experience so far. Um, yeah. I don't want to take up, you know, too much of everyone's evening. I, I'm out in the, on the West Coast right now. I know it's a little later for you all. So, I mean, I, I guess, Rick, maybe we can end now, but I just want to, you know, say again to everyone, if you want to talk with me one-on-one or whatever, just reach out and I'm always happy to jump on the phone to talk about whatever, Bain recruiting, <laughs> if you want, um, to, you know, climbing to coffee um, or Princeton, What seriously, whatever uh, you want to talk about, just uh, reach out. Kason, thank you so much for sharing your evening with us and, and sharing, you know, some of, you know, your great wisdom of, you know, how, how it, you know, how adventure really can translate into, you know, kind of a, a mindset and a way of life that, that obviously you're still, you're, you're living now in a different way as an entrepreneur, um, but is, you know, is just as, it's just as, it's just as much a summit attempt um, as, as many of your other ones. So um, it's a lot scarier. (laughs) Anyway. Yeah. Thank you, Rick. Thank you again, Rick, Caroline, all, you know, the whole OA team, the LGBT center. Thank you uh, for having me and uh, good luck with this upcoming school year. I know it's a crazy, crazy time and not ideal for anyone. Um, And yeah, happy to be in touch. As I said. Awesome. Thank you so much, Casey. And and thank you all of you for joining us tonight. Yes, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you so much.